things you've said today. I just wanted to ask, um, I, I personally have a, I've um, been born into a Messianic Jewish family um, with parents who are believers that Yeshua is the Messiah. And, um, and what, what my question is, I, I've heard it said, and please forgive me if I'm wrong because I, I don't know heaps, um, that of the old, of the old the Hebrew scriptures, um, Christians interpret it through the lens of the New Testament. But I've also heard it said, um, or thought, that um, with Orthodox Judaism there is a, um, the oral law, or that where which is which gives um, an authority to the interpretation of, of people like yourself. And I was wondering um, why, because I've read the, the whole scripture and studied it for many years now, and um, I was wondering why do you give such authority to the oral law as, we, as you do to the writings of Moses? Um, Good question. Um, when we speak about the written Torah, that does not really refer to the whole Bible. The written Torah is a set, or the whole Bible is part of the written Torah, these things were recorded, but the essence, the beginning and the end of everything is the five books of Moses. No one, the greatest prophets on earth, can add one letter or one iota, or diminish one letter or one iota from the five books of Moses. Judaism begins and ends with Moses. And if you look at the various other prophetic books, they really don't say anything. They don't say anything. In terms of religion being divine revelation, divine inspiration, a divine code of conduct, the only rules of conduct appear in the five books of Moses. The prophetic books, what are they? They're sermons. They're prophecies. But basically, sermonic prophecies. Where the prophets lambast the people, they chastise them, Look what you have done and this and that. And because of your uh, lifestyle and suppose, these and those things are going to happen to you as punishments, prophesying all these things, also prophesying the bliss, etc., etc. But none of the prophetic books, not one of them, adds anything to the moral life, uh, the conduct, code of, code of behavior that the five books, the 613 mitzvot, they're all in the Chumash, all in the five books of Moses. Now, let's look at the five books of Moses. Let's look at these 630 commandments. There is not one single commandment in the Torah, practically. Maybe one, a couple of exceptions. That the way it is written in the Torah makes any sense. That the way it is written in the Torah would instruct me what I have to do and how I have to do it. For example, the Torah says not to work on the Sabbath. Right? What is called work on the Sabbath? The Torah doesn't give me a definition. Just, you shall do no form of labor on the Sabbath. If I were to pick up this podium, it's pretty heavy, and I put it on my back, and I run from here to, to the front of this campus and run back 10 times, by the time I get back here, probably way before, I'll have collapsed and lie on the floor out of it. Did I violate the Sabbath? Answer is no. On the other hand, I don't know if you have here on this campus, in these buildings, sensor lights. Once upon a time, you want light, you still knock the two socks together, you uh, rub two, two pieces of sticks together. At the very least, modern times, you flick the switch. Today, I don't even have to flick the switch. I just walk in front of the sensor light the way I walk anyway. I'm not doing anything, and the light goes on by itself. Now, if I know there's a sensor light over there, and if I walk in that proximity to that sensor light, and I do so, and I can walk it the whole day Shabbat as I please, I have violated the Sabbath. I violated Shabbat. Let's take another line in the Torah. Circumcision. Do you know what circumcision means? Are we talking about circumcision of the heart? Circumcision, the commandment in the oh, Torah the to circumcise. Yes. The Bible. What does it mean? Um, physically, yes. cut the foreskin of the penis. Interesting. Oh. And where do you get that from? <laughs> On, and, uh, a few days after the baby's been born. Where do you get that definition from? Oh, good point. Um, it's not in, it's You'll not find it anywhere. The ex 
you will not find it anywhere. Nowhere in the Torah, nowhere in the prophets, nowhere in the scriptures. If anything, when the scriptures, when the Bible speaks about circumcision, it uses a very ambiguous word. Like you just mentioned, the circumcision of the heart. For that matter, the Hebrew word for the foreskin is orlo. Orlo does not mean foreskin of the penis. It doesn't mean that at all. Orlo is a word which is applied to fruits, the first three years of its growth. Orlo is simply a covering which could apply to X number of things. There's also the covering of the heart. Are you talking about the foreskin of the heart that you have to circumcise? What is circumcision? You look from Genesis 1-1 all the way to the end of the Bible. You're nowhere going to find a definition for circumcision. And yet this becomes so fundamental a principle in Judaism. So fundamental an idea that even the least religious people somehow observe that as well. They may eat a ham sandwich with a glass of milk on Yom Kippur. <laughs> but somehow the children they will circumcise. It's somehow something which goes even beyond their own mind. But where do you get it from? It's a fundamental, the very first Jewish practice. The very first act that is identified specifically with Jewish identity, going all the way back to Abraham, the first Jew. Where do you get the definition of circumcision? Maybe it means the tip of your nose, maybe your earlobe, maybe the tip of one of your fingers. Where do you get it from? The Torah speaks about tefillin, phylacteries. What does the Torah say? We say that every day in the Shema. Tie it for a sign upon your hand and for frontlets between your eyes. Tie what? Tie where? Tie how? I understand. There is practically not a single commandment in the Torah which makes any sense. If you just take the Torah as the written word of God that you have in your hands. Moreover, in the Torah there's a lot of dietary laws, which is not only the allowed, the permitted animals and the forbidden animals, but also once you have an animal, how animals have to be slaughtered. And there's a very special way how animals have to be killed and slaughtered. Very special way. What does the Torah say about the animals that have to be slaughtered? Which in Hebrew is called Shechita. The Torah says, and you shall slaughter the animals, your cattle, as I have commanded you. I have searched the whole Bible from beginning to end and from end to beginning, and I found not one single passage anywhere that should tell me how to slaughter an animal. Not one. Not even coming close. And so it is with practically every single law and commandment in the Torah. But these laws were given to be practiced. These laws were made mandatory. Either you observe the laws salvation, or you negate and ignore the laws barbecue. <laughs> but I don't know what to do, when to do, how to do. How would the Jews know? How did Moses know? How did anybody else know? Obviously then, quite explicitly stated in the Torah, they got these commandments, not only as commandments, but with the explication and explanation and interpretation what each commandment means. That is what we call the oral Torah. Why was this kept oral? Why was it not recorded? That's a separate subject. But there is proof in the Torah itself, right from the very beginning, that the written code came accompanied by an oral code. And therefore, if anybody Anybody on earth wants to understand what the Torah, the Jewish Bible, is talking about, there is only one on earth, one on earth, that can possibly tell you what the Old Testament is talking about. Namely, who? The Jew. No one else. You cannot have, suddenly, 2,000 years after the giving of the Torah, after the Torah has been practiced, after the Torah has been taught, somebody suddenly showing up and saying, you know, you guys, you are the only ones who haven't got a clue what the Torah is talking about. I will tell you what the Torah is talking about. I will tell you what this passage in Isaiah, or this passage in Jeremiah, or this passage in Deuteronomy, or this passage in Exodus, what it is talking about. Can you imagine anything more stupid, more incredible, 
that a Johnny come lately who hasn't got a clue, hand hold the Jewish Bible right side up, is going to tell me what my Bible, which I have kept for three and a half thousand years, which I preserved, which is written in my language, given to me by my prophets in my Hebrew tradition? If not for us, would they have the Bible? Would they know anything about the Bible? What did people do before Christianity came along? One and a half, one and a half thousand years before they came along, there was already a living Judaism, practiced Judaism. And now to come one and a half thousand years later and say, hey you guys, you got it all wrong. You haven't got a clue what it's talking about. I will tell you what I say it's talking about. I will tell you what Moses is talking about. I will tell you what Jeremiah is talking about. Can you imagine any more stupid argument than that? For the original tradition, you have to go to the original people. The people who got it, the people that this was given to, the people that were given both the, the text and the interpretation of the text, the people who practice it throughout the years. According to Christian tradition, what they are saying in effect is that for one and a half thousand years the Torah and the Biblical the prophets were meaningless, worthless junk. It was not even a comic book. Because the meaning of it was revealed only some two thousand years later. I'm simply telling you where I come from and where you would see that from our angle. There's no way that you cannot understand why we reject it.